Okay, everyone. This is me recording myself. I'm not trying to uh, do too much here, but I want you to see uh, my slides. And it's a new test. I'm, I'm just screen recording instead of recording my voice while looking at the slides. That's why you're seeing this recording thing. I, I kind of hope I can get rid of it later, but this is my first time doing this, so please understand any mistakes or screw-ups here. Anyway, on to the uh, real subject of the matter. We're going to be talking about native video gamers and the arcade predecessors. What, what were the uh, predecessors to arcades? What influenced arcades before arcades were a thing? And so I thought I'd show you some of that. And this is uh, a going to be a three-parter. Uh, we're going to show you arcade predecessors and then in a, another video we're going to show you a um, thing about uh, arcade history and then after that we're going to talk about arcades in the world and how they're different from the arcades that I grew up with and what how the culture I thought existed worked. So I want you to know that and this is the, uh, the week of uh, January the January 8th through 12th. All right, here we go. Okay, so the first thing that you are going to uh, be seeing is arcade shopping centers. And I got almost all of these files from Wikipedia, so there you go. The one on the right is actually um, open to, to the public domain. That's actually a, um, a mall in... I forget, Cleveland, I believe. But the reality is, what you're looking at isn't a mall. It's called an arcade. And you're like, but an arcade, it, it, it's, it's, you know, it's where the games are, right? And the answer is no. An arcade is a room where there are a bunch of arches. So if you look in this area, and if you look in all these pictures, you can just see a bunch of arches. And it's basically a covered shopping area, a covered open shopping area. It was a predecessor to a mall. Back in Victorian era, they would have these arcades, and they would have, like, in a certain room, there would be some games, and in another room, they'd have uh, interesting shows. And it wasn't just a shopping center. It was, it was fascinating to look at, if you ever get the chance to really look at them. It is a, a circus show in the next room. It might be an, a uh, play in the next room. It might be, you know, some foreign group is there to perform things to show their their weird ways it was a very different idea and look at this architecture it's just gorgeous honestly and you'll notice it looks very similar to the way malls were set up and that's because there's only so many ways you can set something up and this is a really good method if you ever think about it this also looks like a video game but i'm going to have to make that for a different video but the arcade not only was what we had before the concept of arcade it was also where we get the term from it was actually the shopping mall area eventually people started to reference just the game itself as the arcade this is the arcade because it has arcade games in it but really the arcade is this entire mall area on to the next one okay gambling halls are older than sin actually they're as old as sin because they're one of the first ones <clears throat> i'm fairly certain you know somewhere back in the day somebody's like hey bet you can't do this and they're like oh yeah okay i can do it uh what you see in the background is actually i believe that is blackpool in the background or uh, the one on the left and the one on the right is a photo from China in the uh, 19th century, but they're both gambling halls. And the importance of these gambling halls is that they were just open rooms where people would game, and they would sometimes game with money, and sometimes money wouldn't be involved. You know, you could actually walk in and be like, I'd like to play a game of chess, and you could play a game of chess with somebody, and it would be an expert, and you might have to pay the person for, it, for the uh, expert for his time, but, you know, you could play a game of chess. That was the uh, the joy of these rooms, is you could find them just about anywhere. These gambling halls, these gaming rooms, and they would just be everywhere. And they would be really useful and really kind of get the idea of how an arcade should be built. If you look, everything is set up 
in the same way a modern day arcade would be set up. And in fact, that is a modern day arcade, but that's going to be uh, getting ahead of ourselves. And then to your right, you see uh, the Chinese uh, gambling hall, very similar. If you look a little, you can almost see them kind of leaning over, waiting for the guy to do, you know, the high score or, you know, what's going to be next. And that's, that's kind of what I wanted to show you. And then they had trade fairs. Back in the medieval era and earlier and a little later, they would have trade fairs where people would come in and they'd show their wares off and they'd have new technologies to show off. And there would be games with this technology to, to kind of display. Although this is a medieval fair, this is a reenactment type place, a renaissance fair, if you will. Really, these fairs were a real thing and they happened all the time. And there were specific games that they had where you know you could make some money or you could win a prize uh the coin tossers where you would toss a coin and if you were lucky it would arrive in a cup if it landed in the cup whatever was being held or the, whatever the cup was on would in fact be the prize uh it would how do i describe this so there would be a plate there would be a prize and there would be a, a little cup if you get your coin into the cup you win that prize in the plate of course it was very difficult and not a lot of people were able to make it but you can find uh, traces of this throughout history uh, amazing technology would be introduced apparently in the 11th oh wait sorry 14th century somebody created a game where you could play tic-tac-toe another person played a game where you know they would shuffle the balls and you would have to figure out the balls and these types of fairs didn't happen just in Europe they happened throughout all of Eurasia and even in the Americas we don't have a lot of examples for the Americas, but we know they existed because, frankly, they're still going on right now. We call them powwows, but that's what they were. They were just as uh, similar to this as, that, as anything else. So a trade fair is important because you kind of, it was, it was kind of an early arcade or an early mall. And it would just kind of appear and there'd be rides and there'd be stuff. And you would just walk down this alleyway or down this road and you'd just be like, oh, that looks like a fun game. Yes, I think I'll play it. The entire basis of the games is, you know, it's, it's, a, moment's, it's a moment's loss. It's a quick thing that you can do and it'll cost you, you know, a coin or something. But really, you're doing it for, you know, just kind of the fun of it. All right. Oh, and uh, this is actually the Konix Ruins uh, Medieval Fair. I, I've got the Wikimedia... Uh, statement right there. It, I tried to put in as many files here, so if you ever feel like it, you can go look them up and you can find the people who made these pictures. There, there's some really cool stuff. The next thing is bathhouses. Bathhouses don't sound interesting to you. That They don't even sound like it would make sense. But you have to realize that it, they weren't playing just uh, in the baths. In ancient Rome and Greece, they would actually have rooms separated away from the bath where you could go in and you could read. You know, there's a library there, and then you'd play a game with somebody. And, you know, there'd be gambling, and there'd be little games and maybe some food for sale. So people would be going to these, and they'd be fascinating uh, places to visit. So if you have a chance, you should totally, you know, check out the ancient Roman baths and just look at the rooms to the side and go, wow, I wonder what else was here. And very likely, I, I theorize in a book, I, I'm making a book on um, what an early arcade would look like, and some of the things you're looking at are going to be added into this book. You know, what was the technology of the time, and how would they make arcade games for that era? So in this Roman bathhouse, although I haven't added them to this picture, you can see people playing games, and they'd be based on, you know, what somebody would be playing in a bathhouse. Uh, fascinating ideas. I don't know if anybody will buy the book, but it, you have to look at the bathhouses and be like, yeah, that was where a gathering would happen. There would be technology there, and the people would be playing games. It would be the perfect spot for an arcade. Okay, the Kabuki District in Japan. That doesn't make a lot of sense to you, I'm sure. But if you know Japanese history, you know that the Kabuki Theater had way more influence in Japan than we ever let on. 
The Kabuki Theater was started by a prostitute. Um, and yes, that means exactly what you think it means. Uh, the, the theater would have this big show, and then, you know, they'd be like, and who would like to spend some time with Princess Mononoke? Oh, she's a wolf. <clears throat> she's an animal. Oh, and how about, you know, Hime Hitaku? Oh, yes, you totally. Oh, she's a babe. Spend some time. And that doesn't sound like much, but the Kabuki Theater was for the, the ignoble people, the, the lesser people. The bigger, more noble people would have something called a no play, which is very boring. And oh, It's not boring, but they take a story that everybody knows, and then they would reenact it. And they would try to show the emotions and the understanding of those moments to the greatest detail they could. It would take five minutes to cross from one end of the from one end of the stage to the other. And throughout this time, they're showing emotion and showing how they think on something. And then somebody walk, would walk in and this person would show emotion. And it's basically an hour-long uh, play about a conversation. And uh, a friend of mine says it's like watching, actually it was a professor of mine, has said that it's like watching uh, paint dry, only less interesting. But... The Kabuki Theater was where they came up with this idea of let's make it kind of bombastic and for the lower people and kind of fast. And the prostitutes started it, started it, and they kind of made it illegal for uh, the prostitution to happen as much. But the Kabuki Theater became so popular that it started to make a ton of money, and people started to go in, going to it and forgetting their chores. And you know the feudal lords didn't like this, so they made this little district, and they said this is the Kabuki district. And in this district was gambling and was, you know, I don't, uh, brothels. And they would have, you know, kabuki theater there. And the feudal lord started to go there, the daimyo, the, the shogun. And by the time uh, Commodore Perry showed up in Japan, pretty much all of the feudal lords were broke and owed money to the kabuki theaters throughout all of Japan. It started off in one little t uh, city, and it just kept on growing and growing and growing. And soon they became very powerful over the people. And so when Commodore Perry showed up, it was a, a release. It was a chance for the people to change themselves from these feudal lords who owed everybody money and were, were frankly kind of useless to, you know, something new and this new idea. And the people who were in charge of these little theater areas, uh, they weren't little anymore, by the way, they started to buy into the feudal lord thing. And I don't mean, oh, they, they started to buy into the idea of the feudal lord. I mean, they bought themselves feudal titles. And they were the origin of what you call the Yakuza. They were the illegal people. And right after World War II, they were the ones with the money to invest in things. And they were the ones who talked to the American soldiers and were like, hey, we need investments into these things and we'd like some help with that. If you don't mind, huh? No. Nah. Oh, by the way, you know, here's a Kabuki theater. Don't you think Princess uh, Matsumono looks kind of cute? Huh? 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 So the Kabuki theater is an incredibly important thing, and they actually had arcades. Or they had, you know, areas where people would game, and they'd, they had uh, dolls there. Or not dolls. Um, they had statues that would move. And these things were incredibly intricate and very well designed. And they had some games, and they would have all these things. So it's an incredibly important period, and it also influenced arcade culture in Japan as well as the everywhere else, because this right here is where most of Japanese arcade culture came from. Not only uh, in one way, but in all the others. So you have to accept that video games came from this idea. Oh, and of course, we have to add that the Japanese ninja, as you imagine it, comes from the Kabuki theaters. The people dressed in black or blue who were off uh, whisking themselves in the background, those were actually the theater people trying to, you know, stay hidden in the black background as they made big things happen. There's a lot of jokes about it in modern day Japan, but yes, that is the ninja. He comes from a kabuki theater and he's just a, uh, he's a theater guy, a backstage guy. <laughs> Okay, the next thing you have to recognize is militaries, and it goes with the Kabuki Theater. Video games, or arcade games, were very much so, you know, one or two cultures had it. 
But these one or two cultures were everywhere. They were traveling everywhere. Uh, what, what you have is some 1920s naval ships. Uh, the one on the left is actually a Japanese ship, I believe. And the picture on the right, that's World War I. I. I forget where it is, but that's one of the trenches. And the people with all of this technology to make arcade games, and this was, this was before uh, video games. Video, video didn't exist yet. They just had these mechanical machines that would play games. And they would, they would arrive in a place and they'd be like, you know what would be really nice? One of these games. I would love one of these games. And so some really smart guy would be like, you know what? I can import it for you. I can order it from the U.S. I can order it from Britain. I can order it from France. I can bring it here and we can play it. And, you know, the military guys would be like, yeah, that would be great. I've got money to spare. Let's do this. And so a lot of arcade culture came from these military groups arriving in places and going like, you know, we'd really like this. And soon that became kind of a tourist thing and uh, it went from there. But a lot, a lot of arcade culture comes from these military importers and how the militaries would be in an area and be like, I want an arcade game. <sighs> Computing machines. Oh, Okay, this is going to be kind of a weird thing for you to think about, but the machine on the left is a touring machine. And I don't mean it, you know, it, it tours around the world. I mean, it was named after Alan Turing, who helped uh, solve many of the, the how do I say this, uh, secret codes from uh, Germany. And they would use these machines to figure out what the messages were. You know, they would uncode them. On the right, you'll see uh, Bletchley Park uh, workers. It was uh, mostly uh, Bletchley Park is a place in England, and it would and during World War II, that's all they did was they would go in, they would look at you know letters from Germany, and they would decode them. And these it was mostly women who worked there, and they were very intelligent, smart women. I found out about it through a show called Bletchley Circle. Yeah, it's it's kind of a dumb show, but. It really does open your eyes like, oh, wow, this this was a major thing. And so they would have these machines and, you know, only a few people were allowed to touch these machines or be in the same room as these machines. So people would, you know, start putting in stuff and they'd be like, OK, I need this to be computed. Take it into the computing room and let only the computing people deal with it. That's where our ideas of computers come from. It's literally just from these computational machines. And you have to realize that this was look at these wires and how they maneuver and how they go this was computers even into the 1980s many machines looked like this and you have to recognize this as part of you know the culture within video games and within uh, computer geeks as well is these machines right there also that women were never degraded in this culture or in the computing culture if they did the work, they were part of the group. No questions asked. So that's something you have to kind of see is, you know, they took the, many of these computing machines and when they started to, to use them for arcade machines, they had a lot of the same ideas within them, but you couldn't see that. You could just see, you know, an elephant raising its nose or something like that. Okay, and so computing machines become very, very important, but not in the way everybody thinks of. or. In a, in a different way from how uh, you would think. You're first thinking of, you know, oh, the arcade machine, but really it's the culture itself that helps. 